shall we? So, um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shelly Hod Moyal. I'm uh, the founding partner of iAngels, and I'm very happy to be here and host uh, this panel to speak about blockchain. I think that over the last uh, year or so, we've been hearing a lot in the news uh, about blockchain and the technology and how revolutionary it can be and how it's going to change our lives. Uh, but the reality is, is that it really hasn't changed any of our lives yet. And, uh, and I think that if you're not uh, very much involved in the industry and the ecosystem, many of you may not, be, may not be aware of what blockchain uh, really is. And, uh, and so the purpose of this panel is really to talk about uh, blockchain technology and, um, and also cryptocurrencies, uh, regulatory issues, the future use cases, and really everything, uh, um, everything that, is, uh, that is related to the industry. And uh, with that, I wanted to start with, uh, maybe I'll let everybody from the panel introduce themselves in one sentence, and we can begin the dialogue. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm Galanda Ali. I'm the former acting CEO of Challenge. Thank you again for coming. I'm Galanda Ali. I'm the former acting CEO of the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. These days, I'm a research fellow at the Center for Cyber Law and Policy at the Haifa University. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, I've been punished for the <laughs> dynamic line. Um, <laughs> my name is Ido Sademan. Um, I'm leading uh, the Saga Foundation, uh, which is uh, a project to design a global uh, currency as a counterpart to sovereign fiat currencies. Hi, I'm uh, Dovev Goldstein. I'm uh, the CMO of uh, Firmo Network. Uh, we're building the infrastructure for crypto, uh, secure financial uh, instruments for the crypto economy. Hi, I'm Danny Brownwolf. I work at Orbs, which is a public blockchain. Uh, my background is actually in your world, policy. I worked at the UN with uh, Ron Prasor, and I worked with Michael Owen before, so did a nice switch. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Agadana Mary. I'm the general uh, manager of iCapital. iCapital is a subsidiary of, of iAngels. It's an investment firm focused on blockchain uh, investments, blockchain startups. Uh, we have an online platform that allows investors from all over the world to see what we invest in and participate in individuals deal individual deals with us. Uh, and we also have an actively managed fund, an advisory service, and uh, and uh, several other services that are uh, relating to the blockchain industry. Hi, I'm Adrian Daniels. I'm a partner at the law firm of Yigal Arnon, and I head the crypto and blockchain department there. Hi, my name is Tzvika Gross. I'm a partner in BDO. It's an accounting firm in Israel. I'm also um, a computer engineer, and I'm a partner in the technology cluster in BDO dealing with many technology high-tech companies, and now coming the old blockchain scene and cryptocurrencies as well. Okay. So um, I'd actually like to start with you, Ido, as the founder of Saga, which is building a compliant cryptocurrency and also has, many experience, has a lot of experience as a VC and investor in the space. I thought it would be useful if you can help everybody understand a little bit about the difference between blockchain and Bitcoin. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so if there is an amalgam between blockchain and Bitcoin, it's, um, it's not a coincidence because blockchain was not invented as a technology per se, uh, but rather as the underlying technology of a solution, which is uh, Bitcoin. Um, or which was Bitcoin, and, and, and they've started to part ways um, about five years ago. So Bitcoin was basically an answer uh, both to the financial crisis 10 years ago, um, which uh, represented a sort of a trust crisis in, in the established financial um, system, and the base um, ideological paradigm of, of Bitcoin was an 
rather anarchistic or libertarian one. Um, and and, and the, the issue that Bitcoin tried to solve was rather simple. If I own money and I want to transfer it to anyone else, I shouldn't be uh, subject to the censorship of no one and I shouldn't be uh, needing to use any intermediary. So trying to replicate in, in larger scale um, a cash transaction. If, if I have cash in my pocket and I want to transfer it to, to any of you, I don't need to use any uh, intermediary uh, and I'm not subject to censorship. Um, the way to implement it was, I invite you to think of it uh, as, as um, an evolution of peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing. Right, it's, it's a rather old technology, 20 years old, where if I have a file, a music file or a movie and I want to share it with any of you, um, then I don't have to go through any central server. Um, we can simply uh, uh, share a protocol uh, which is based on, 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 on the internet, on, on HTTP or TCP protocols and, and transfer my file to you. Um, the issue with file sharing and why it's not uh, as successful with value is the issue that is called uh, the double spending issue. If I have a file, I can uh, uh, transfer it to as many of you as I want, uh, which works for, for files but doesn't work for with value. If I have $10 and I can send them to this entire room, then I have $800, but I don't. I have only 10 and I can only spend it once. And so... Um, Blockchain was uh, invented as a solution within Bitcoin for this issue, uh, which is the double spending issue. And for us to be able to, and I'm extremely simplifying here, but for, for, for me to be able to uh, send value to uh, w within the network, um, any participant on this network needs to hold a copy of, the dat of a dat database um, of a sort of balance sheet uh, where all the transactions are recorded in all copies of the same database. And only if they are recorded on all copies of the, the database, which everyone uh, uh, part, being part of the network holds, uh, then the, the transaction is correct. And so if I send Rachel $10, then all the databases are acknowledging that, and I don't have those $10 anymore, and now Rachel has them. Um, so this was the invention, invention uh, um, of, of Bitcoin as, and blockchain as the technology to power it. Um, the, the big uh, uh, leap of blockchain came a few years later with the invention of Ethereum saying, well, if we have this uh, uh, a network of da databases, then why limit them only to the logic of transferring money? We can actually build a Turing complete. Uh, so uh, um, um, business logic that can contain all arguments that can be implemented by computers uh, and instead of having a central server or a central database, we will use those, this decentralized uh, data database where there is no central governor um, to, to this application or to this contract, but we can implement whatever logic we want on it, whether it's insurance or voting mechanisms or Facebook. Uh, we can imp implement whatever we want with the, this decentralized uh, a network of databases replacing the central database and, and thus decentralizing governance. So Bitcoin remains uh, one application uh, over the blockchain and the one that the Genesis application, the, the one that invented blockchain, which is uh, to build a currency with no central uh, uh, governance, but, but many uh, additional 5,000, I believe, to date, um, 5,000 or so additional applications were invented based on the same technology that had nothing to do with Bitcoin anymore. So I understand that the significance of blockchain actually and the blockchain technology is that it is possible for us to reach a consensus with one another without actually having a government. So it's possible now to have decentralized organizations or decentralized mechanisms allowing us to um, reach agreement without, uh, without a centralized control authority. Now, it's interesting uh, for me to understand if now that, in a sense, we don't need governments anymore and technically we can code any type of governance we want on the blockchain, um, does everything need to be centralized? Decentralized. With Maybe, uh, well, anybody can answer, but perhaps uh, Gal or Ido. So, <laughs> um, 
I think that this decentralization and, and, and uh, not anyone, or not everyone in, on, in this table would probably agree and, and definitely not in the blockchain community. I think that decentralization is not an end, it's a mean. Um, and um, I, I consider it as a means to solve three main uh, issues. Um, one is the lack of government. Um, so if we want, for example, to solution global problems in the lack of a global government, uh, then the ability to create a global governance uh, without the government is extremely useful. Uh, the second issue is when, where the, the governor is biased. Okay, so we, we see many fields where uh, this notion of impartial governance, of the governor uh, um, being supposed only to judge a contract by its logic, but not to have a target in the contract itself, um, uh, are not true anymore. Um, I think the easiest way to explain it would be probably an insurance contract. So an insurance contract is a damage spreading contract. It is done between uh, uh, those who are insured and, and not between every insured one and, and uh, the insurance company. Um, and the insurance company is only here to govern, which means that it should not have any incentive in the contract itself. Uh, but we see that as, in, as, as the insured party to the contract, we want to pay as low as contribution as possible and to get as highly as remunerated as we can. However, now we see that the insurance company wants the opposite, which means they are already a part of the contract and not the governor. Here, blockchain is useful because we don't have a governor and therefore we cannot have any governance bias. Uh, and the third thing is where the governance cost is too high to, for, for an economy to bear. Um, and so we see a lot of uh, um, economies that are uh, um, being combined together and normalized simply because uh, each one of those uh, single economies cannot bear the governance cost. Um, but decentralization comes with a huge cost as well. Um, decentralization means less efficiency. It's much more efficient to take a decision once and to broadcast it than to take it uh, as, as many times as stakeholders we have. Um, probably just as much as democracy is less efficient than, than a good uh, old dictatorship, right? Um, I, it doesn't mean that dictatorship doesn't, I'm, I'm, I'm not proning the dictatorship, I'm not saying that it comes without a price. I'm saying that if it is judged only in the efficiency perspective, then a dictatorship is, is more uh, efficient than uh, a democracy, and a democracy is more efficient than a referendum-based democracy, uh, because as many people uh, that needs to be uh, involved in the decision-making process, the process becomes longer, more cumbersome, uh, and more costly. So I don't think that everything should be decentralized. Um, if, if to take the example of, of a currency, then if you live in Britain or in the US, then probably your central bank and government and um, the fiscal policy, the monetary policy, uh, is handled just fine. If you live in Venezuela, that's probably uh, where decentralization could come to mind. So I think it's on a case per case uh, basis. It's also interesting, Shelley, if I may add. Um, <coughs> Switzerland had its first uh, blockchain-backed voting uh, this past week in a city called Zug, which is in Crypto Valley. Um, and it actually shows where we keep on talking about, you know, d uh, democracy and how to optimize it. And all of a sudden you have a tool or a technology that actually allows you to optimize it in ways that you haven't had before. And it's a little bit of a disruption because it means that for people who are MPs, for example, then you may be disposable if you don't give added value to your audience, to your constituencies. Because if they can vote on the budget, if they get uh, and vote directly based on blockchain and it's immutable, then you need to give other value in order to be um, a valued inter intermediary instead of just waste in the system. Can I just also add, uh, as the lawyer spoiler uh, comment <laughs> is, you know, while Obviously, decentralization has its um, has a lot of advantages. Um, it also has certain disadvantages. And a centralized government, as I'm sure many of you would appreciate, you know, wasn't just set up to control people's lives because people wanted to control people's lives. It was all, it's also there to protect people and help people. Um, not everybody out there is scrupulous. Not everybody out there has everybody else's uh, best interests at heart. So while decentralization is good, you need to have a, have a healthy, I think, combination of both decentralization and regulation that is um, applicable and workable that can allow the advantages of decentralization without, um, without allowing it to become chaotic and, and, and ultimately damaging. 
Thank if you. If I may add to that, uh, <laughs> it's been a good question. I will have to say <laughs> something. <laughs> I have to think of it. Uh, I think uh, what we can say uh, in that matter that uh, this, this concept of decentralization uh, enables uh, for the first time to separate between the two uh, um, purposes of, uh, of uh, the regulation, uh, of, of regulation. Uh, one is the policy making and the other one is the governing part of it. Uh, the governing is the part where we see in most governments uh, the inefficiency and the part where the governments uh, fail to, uh, to fulfill their purpose. However, in policy making, democracy is probably the best, uh, the best known uh, a method to, to decide how to um, uh, maintain a, a good uh, society or a healthy society that moves uh, forward. So decentralization enables the part of governing to be uh, written on the on decentralized uh, uh, databases, while the policy makers would need to focus mainly on policy making. And this is what we all expect from uh, the people that we, uh, that we vote for. So I think that uh, this is the, uh, in a way, this is the promise of blockchain that, that blockchain could bring to the world. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting, actually, all the points you raise. And um, one of the frameworks we've been seeing lately in blockchain are blockchains that are bringing forward uh, democracy-type consensus. Where, uh, where you have a delegate system and you elect uh, people that represent, r represent you uh, within the consensus. And one of the things that's beautiful about, about blockchain, and I feel that, that Danny, you touched about, upon it uh, a second ago, is that it keeps the leaders in check because in a blockchain system, everything is open. So if you're unhappy with your leaders, then you can fork the technology. And in fact, this is something that we've been seeing over the last, uh, over the last year or so, where uh, communities such as Bitcoin and such as Ethereum have, um, have decided for one reason or another that the current consensus uh, is something they're unhappy with. So they uh, basically decided to fork the technology and create their own communities, which I think uh, is a good mechanism to keep your, your leaders in check. With that, I'd like to uh, maybe talk a little bit about the use cases around financial services, because blockchain is a way that, um, that enables us to facilitate value transfer in a more efficient way. One of the most natural use cases for blockchain technology is uh, finance. Uh, Dovev, as the CMO of Fermo, which is uh, aiming to disrupt the infrastructure of finance, why don't you talk to us a little bit about financial services today and what they will look uh, like in the future as we integrate blockchain technology? Uh, I'll try to do so. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if we we'll, uh, look on the uh, on the, pr the involvement of, uh, of blockchain, crypto, and uh, even the ICO part of, thank you. Uh, uh, from uh, from the Hawkeye point of view, uh, we can see that in the beginning of any uh, birth of any technology, uh, like cloud and definitely with uh, blockchain technology, uh, in the beginning it's a disrupt disruptive uh, technology. Uh, so it uh, it has an enemy. Normally it's the uh, the legacy technology or the legacy uh, authorities or. Uh, companies that exist in the market, and they are the, the bad guys, and the innovators are the good guys, and there is some kind of a PR struggle between the two, uh, where uh, it comes to a phase where the technology evolves into something that uh, it really has uh, an added value, where uh, both parties understand that there is a benefit, uh, there is a much bigger mutual benefit if the legacy uh, organizations, companies, and regulators embrace this technology uh, and they are actually the ones who can generate uh, the best solution uh, for the audience for, for the people based on the on those technologies so I think that in a way the phase the first phase of uh, blockchain where it was anarchist as I mentioned earlier or that it had uh, some kind of the the new era of uh, uh, of everything uh, is now evolved into, into a phase where each one of the projects uh, is aiming to, to, uh, to solve something that is, hasn't been solved before by the, the current technology or by the legacy technology. And it enables the financial institutions 
bring the value uh, out of the, this technology to their uh, to the users. So I definitely can see how uh, the next phase of blockchain would be the embracement by the financial uh, organizations. Some of them already put their uh, tiptoes in the water and test uh, these kinds of uh, solutions, like banks and uh, other financial institutions. And I believe that in the next year, uh, year or so, we'll see more and more uh, projects that are being uh, uh, combined and partner with uh, uh, legacy types of uh, financial institutions uh, from bank, insurance companies, uh, uh, lending companies, and all of those uh, uh, organizations that uh, would have huge benefit by having uh, trust being bring, uh, brought to their uh, customers, to their users. Uh, which is the, the thing that blockchain can really bring to those uh, organizations. How many of you guys uh, trust their insurance company? <laughs> Not even one. <laughs> However, let's imagine a world where your, the insurance company uh, had all their database open to the public and they said that they, they, uh, a, any transaction, anything that ha happens in, within their database is open to the public. Then you would probably trust them. All of us would trust uh, this type of uh, organization, this type of, uh, of uh, financial organization. If we brought this promise to any of the financial institutions, probably they would benefit much more than having a new uh, startup or a new company that is trying to bring this technology and making people uh, stop using their current financial institutions and start using the new ones. So I think that the next phase of uh, the financial uh, involvement would be mutual projects of uh, startups within the uh, blockchain technology and the uh, legacy uh, large financial institutions. Thank you very much, Dovev. So, so we understand that we don't need to decentralize everything, and we also know that blockchain can help the finance world. I wanted to talk to you, Danny, since you're the CMO of Orbs. Orbs provides blockchain infrastructure as a service for businesses. And very interested to hear in what kind of businesses are you helping with blockchain infrastructure and what is the significance? So uh, we're an infrastructure that's boring uh, because we're basically like, if you think of it in like real world terms, we're like AWS cloud service. So we provide blockchain bandwidth. Uh, specifically our model is that we're a second layer built uh, on top of Ethereum with uh, built-in connectivity through Ethereum so it allows companies that already launched their token on Ethereum uh, to, ma to maintain it there and then run much, it solves the scalability problems of Ethereum. I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna, that's an advanced class, but uh, and more technology focused, but the use cases are very interesting. And I think I, I would just like to take a, a one step back before um, and even talk about the, the model that uh, was used to for fundraising as a disruptor because yes we're working with a lot of financial <coughs> system for example uh, uh, Payki uh, is doing is uh, a company that's working with banks today is now doing a subsidiary on blockchain called Chainkey uh, that we're that we're supporting we have uh, Iron Source which is one of the biggest ad tech companies in the world uh, headquartered here in Israel um, have a subsidiary called Zinc that we help build that's based basically giving value. What does it mean transfer of value? So what we do in our daily lives, um, the philosophy behind uh, the people, the philo general philosophy of the community says, if there's value in it, you should be rewarded for it. What does it mean? Right now I, I put up a post, or I create content on Facebook, and Facebook makes money off the content that I created, and I get access to Facebook. Thank you very much. Um, same with, uh, let's say, TripAdvisor. Okay, TripAdvisor is built on the users giving out, handing out for free information, and they make money off of, off of ads. So uh, the company I worked for before, Orbs Cool Cousin, for example, uh, took blockchain to change that model, to say, okay, if, if we have locals who are contributing knowledge for tourists, like what are the best places to go, similar to Trip, TripAdvisor, they should be rewarded for spending time uh, making this system better. We're gonna share profits with them. And the token economy allows us to do so. So for Zinc that I mentioned with IronSource, they're focusing on game in the gaming world, for example. 
So in gaming, uh, there's an ad tech problem that people don't actually know. Uh, the advertisers don't know anything about the gamers. Like it's not like Facebook where you give out everything. They just know what you like to play. Um, so they're coming up with a model saying, if you uh, decide to give out your personal information, and again, not your identity, but your information, like um, you're a male, how much you earn maybe, oh, how, old you, how old you are, something that's good for advertisers, uh, but blockchain allows you to, uh, to separate that from your real identity, then we're gonna give you extra bonus points every time you see an ad. So you're playing a game and you see ads and those ads, uh, there have, the ad companies have much higher ROI because you gave value to them by giving your information. And therefore, you will be rewarded with tokens. And those tokens you can use to buy more life in the game, uh, to buy, I don't know, an axe in the game. I don't know what these gamers do. But um, it, it's just, it's just uh, um, one, one, one example that's really important for people who are gamers, uh, but can be used anywhere in our daily lives where if we create value, we should get something for it. And the, at the end of the day, maybe I can take all those tokens and buy a Starbucks cup with it. So actually, thank you, Danny, because you've brought up an interesting subject related to blockchain, which is the first blockchain application, and that's crypto, right? Uh, so I guess we can kind of open and speak about the elephant in the room. We understand that blockchain is this amazing technology that can help us govern uh, in a decentralized way. Um, but why do we need crypto? I mean, what's the significance of it? Oh, so, Gal. Gal is a great one for this um, one. <laughs> so I, I think that there are several questions to it, uh, but I'm not sure that the question is, is why do we need crypto, but rather why do we need non-sovereign currencies, right? Because the only currencies that we have probably since Wilkins in, in the UK in, in the Industrial Revolution are sovereign currencies with a central bank that is reacting to uh, a government-led fiscal agenda. Uh, and that's the way, though we have uh, nearly 200 countries in the world, the, the monetary system is rather uh, similar in all of them. Um, so I, I think that the first uh, answer is probably resilience, um, which can only be supported by diversity. I don't know how about you, but I wouldn't go and uh, I wouldn't undergo an operation uh, in an hospital that is uh, connected only to one uh, power uh, network and with no generators uh, for uh, uh, for fail safing. However, when it comes to our monetary world in in the na uh, last 100 years, that's exactly what we do. And when it fails, we reignite it and continue just the same. Um, and this is not highly resilient, right? If if we compare it. Um, to evolution, which is probably the most resilient uh, form we know. Um, it is about diverse mechanisms that are balancing each other, and, and when one fails, then there are other mechanisms uh, um, to account for it. So this, this is one answer for why do we need crypto. Um, the second one, which is what Saga is trying to tackle, is that uh, fiat currencies or nation-state issued currencies are designed to begin with to deal with a, a national scope of trade, right? They're affected mostly by three vectors of decisions, uh, political, uh, uh, monetary, and, and fiscal decisions uh, by a single state. And as long as we tra trade within this state, uh, this, this, this is fine. And as long as we trade between states, it is still fine. But what we're witnessing in the last two or three decades is an ever-growing uh, uh, scope of globalization where we're starting to see nationless products um, and nationless services. A uh, product that can start with a chip that Intel uh, develops here in Jerusalem being shipped to China uh, to be assembled within a computer, being then listed on Amazon, uh, which is a Delaware company with servers operating in North Virginia and the customer being in the UK. Um, very hard to know uh, which economy uh, impacts most this kind of product. And now, uh, just for the sake of an example and, and without uh, uh, making any political judgment, if you're a UK citizen, a day after the Brexit and the pound lost some of its value, then while interacting within the British economy, all is fine, it will eventually be consistent with the value of the pound. But when you go and buy on Amazon, the prices on Amazon did not change because of the decision. Um, and therefore, there is a gap that is being created. 
this gap is being created because we don't have a global government and a global central bank, and so we cannot afford to have global money. Uh, God knows the IMF is trying uh, since 1969 to implement one, uh, but, but it didn't work. And now we can have, uh, um, for example, a global currency, but just as much as we can have a kosher currency, because kosher is an economy as well, um, just as much as we can now support Islamic uh, 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 currency, which is a currency that cannot uh, uh, have any interest rate uh, introduced to it. Um, and, and so we get the possibility to create governance even where government does not exist and therefore to uh, create a, a multitude of monetary instruments that were not uh, uh, enabled in the last um, 100 years or so. Thank you. Thank you, Ida. Uh, actually have a something to add. I think, uh, and I think Danny uh, mentioned it, and it's, it's quite uh, a good example. Um, it's really hard to talk about blockchain today without talking about cryptocurrency. Um, the fact that we're able, or the Facebook is a, Facebook is a good example. The, if we could actually enjoy the value that we're creating into the system, uh, and that we, we would enjoy it better. Um, and the way to actually transfer value between uh, people or from the network uh, in, a, in an easy and actual, actual doable way uh, is, a, is a, through a digital asset. So if you can think about, if you think about, um, uh, if you think about Facebook, say that if you post a, um, a picture that gets a lot of likes or you post an opinion that gets people interested and draws people into into the network, you earn something. Uh, you can't really do it with dollars or whatever currency uh, you, you use in, in your place of where you reside. Uh, I can't, uh, you know, Facebook won't send me, you know, cents for every post that I, that I, actually, uh, that I actually post because it's, it's inefficient, but through digital assets that actually store value, uh, you can get these whatever, Facebook tokens that say crypto, Facebook crypto, uh, which you can then transfer to some, something else that has value. And then at the end of the day, buy uh, a cup of Starbucks with a Zeke token that is another crypto token that, uh, that actually, uh, uh, you know, l bridges the gap between real life uh, assets and the way that we actually transact today to, to the crypto world. So. Um, That's such a good point, Agada, because you also pointed out the fact that there, um, the imbalance of things. So if you look at Facebook, there are people making money off of Facebook and Instagram. There are people who are, who are have like you know a million followers and are getting everything for free and are making millions of dollars. Then you have you know your usual person and and you're not making anything. So there's this huge gra gap, and tok uh, tokenization allows you to have you know spread the wealth. It's, it's basically, if I can add to both your points, which I uh, completely agree with, it creates an incentive system. For the first time, uh, entrepreneurs or people can come together and build an economy that's not necessarily a company or that's not centralized. And as early adopters of this economy, um, or token holders, they're able to benefit from the upside of such an economy if the economy becomes successful. Because these tokens, uh, at the very early stages of the economy, they basically have um, uh, speculative value. And the reason they have speculative value is because as the protocol appreciates, then the token itself grows in value as well. If you can take Bitcoin as an example, Bitcoin today is valued at uh, $7,000, something like that. Uh, in the very early days, it was, just, uh, it was just a couple of cents. And the early adopters of the Bitcoin protocol have enjoyed all this upside, assuming that they, that they held on to the, to the tokens. And so I think that uh, the entrepreneurial aspect of it is, uh, is certainly one of the... Um, is certainly one of the major benefits, which actually brings me to to the point about uh, ICOs and uh, the mechanism that we've seen over the years whereby entrepreneurs are actually using the notion of building an economy and tokenization in order to build new kinds of ventures. And with that, actually, I wanted to talk to Gal, as Gal held executive roles at uh, First International Bank of Israel, as well as the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Can you tell us a little bit about what an ICO 
show is how it compares to an IPO and what are the major points to, to note? Yes, well, well, I'll connect it to just to what you just said and about adoption. Maybe I'll stick with this. Okay, so we'll try. So click this one. We'll try. It's better. Well, actually, for I think that for entrepreneur and for investors, I mean, blockchain tokens are not just, well, I'm sorry, are, are not just a new way for raising funds. It's, it's actually a way for building ecosystems. And this is exactly what Shelley said. I think that adoptions was and is the main challenge for crypto communities. But I think that ICOs are the best way for democratized access to capital, even though they have their setbacks. So, well, it does just represent blockchain, and, and even though blockchain the technology exists for almost 10 years, well, ICO's phenomenon just got market attention through 2016. Well, the, f the first blockchain was in 2013, CoinMasters. It raised something like, it was Bitcoin-based, not token-based. It raised something like $500,000. And since then, during the last five years, I think that the industry raised something like $21 billion. So it's not a niche anymore. Well, ICOs are basic, basically blockchain-based funding mechanisms. Well, if, if I want to highlight the main differences from the IPO mechanism, and I think that we better refer to ICO as a token sale because it's nothing like IPOs. I think that the regulatory, the, the regulation is the main difference. And I think this is what brings us to the next generation of ICOs. I don't know if we have the time to speak about STOs and the security tokens because I think that this is the most interesting thing, phenomenon to speak about. But regarding ICOs, well, and IPOs. Well, IPOs is a fully regulated landscape. It's when company raise money, investors has fully protection, they fully understand their rights. And this is the main set, setbacks when we come to, to ICOs. And I think that we can move to security tokens. You you want to, to speak about security tokens? So I think maybe Tzvika, you're a, you're a partner at um, at BDO, and you raised an interesting issue regarding IPOs being regulated versus ICOs, which are less regulated. And I think one of the more interesting applications, aside from crypto, that we're seeing today on the blockchain is the notion of digitizing real assets. And we've seen different uh, we, we've seen different projects along these lines of people that are digitizing diamonds or digitizing real estate or digitizing crypto kitties. And I think that the, the notion of tokenizing and digitizing uh, different assets uh, is definitely a theme that we're going to see over the next couple of years. And maybe, Tzvika, you can share with us a little bit about how you see the regulation uh, coming in as it relates to ICOs. And also, if you can talk a little bit about security tokens versus utility tokens, which is a major theme that we've been hearing about over the right. last couple of months. So this is a lot of things altogether. I'm going to try to untangle these things a bit. Um, so we heard from Ido in the beginning that really blockchain is a platform, is a technology that serves the cryptocurrency as an application. They use the trust system that is the foundation of the blockchain, and they transform that trust into value. And they, this is the cryptocurrencies that we see. Those cryptocurrencies in general are being mined, meaning the players that participate in the game, they mine, they help build the, the system, the, the blockchain, and they get rewarded with those cryptocurrencies. However, the new world that was built on top of that is the tokens. The tokens, which sometimes are called ICO, the token offering, and this is a way uh, companies raise money for, cer for certain purposes. Now, we know from the regular world, before crypto came, uh, came about, 
that company would, would go and would issue their shares, and that would be an IPO. They would have money as an equity. So initially, if you would want to issue a token and make an ICO to raise money as a capital, that token would be considered something like a share, which means it would be a security. If it's a security, it has to be regulated. There are security laws. If you don't follow the rules, you go to jail. There's no statute of limitations on security law, right? That and murder. So um, what companies were trying to do is they would issue um, tokens and they would say, this is not equity. This is making you part of our community. Think about it as if Disney, instead of issuing shares in the market, they would issue uh, prepaid tickets. So they would say, this is not an equity. You're not part partner with Disney. You just have the right to enter the park. So the same way companies would try to attribute value to those tokens that gives you the ability to participate in whatever the, that company or organization is doing. And by that, deviate from being considered as, um, as a security, as a share, but rather being a uh, utility, a prepaid something, prepaid service or anything else. Now, what happened today, what happen, what's happening today is the SEC is, is haunting all these companies. And what they're saying is, no matter what you say and no matter how you want to portray those, this, at the end of the day, people invest in your tokens because they want to get profit. They don't want to go into Disney Park. They want to make profit. They want to buy it for a dollar and sell it for two. So I'm looking at it as an investment. This is security. And therefore, the SEC is trying to impute very severe regulations. Now, there is already, and that's what you mentioned, Shelley, there's already within the security law few different ways to ease the regulations and to make it happen so you can actually issue security, some of which is, is more known like crowdfunding, which is limited in the capacity, and others are a bit more complicated, chop Terry plus, whatever. There's many, many ways to do that, and this is actually what the reg uh, regulators all over the world are trying to figure out is a way, because they know that it's coming. The, the, the ICO, the tokens, everything is coming. So they're trying to find a way to have everybody invest in that and um, still have a security token, allowed to have a security token. Now, and this is the big, uh, big revelation. Once we pass that barrier and we have the right regulations in place and companies can actually issue securities without having the fear of being hunted by the regulators and the, the security, the SEC, then we're open to a whole new world of what you call the tokenization or digitized assets. And if we want to think about that, really we have already uh, digital assets. We have many digital assets because if you um, go into your broker website and you buy and sell a share, this is the digital asset. Right? If you have a shares in a private company and you want to sell or buy, you have to hire a lawyer and you have to sign a share purchase agreement and you have to find a trustee to move him the money before he moves the share certificate to you. So this is all very cumbersome. But if that uh, share was enlisted in the NASDAQ, it's very easy. You just go in, you log in, and you buy or sell. So this is digital asset. We have that for many decades. The same with commodities. However, the enlisting of these assets, meaning taking the physical assets, making them into digital assets, it's very costly, and you have to pay a very hefty fine to all these regulators and intermediators that allow you and build up the system in which you can trade those. The fact that the, 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 what blockchain is offering, to have a, a decentralized system with maximum trust, as we said before, trust is the service being provided by this centralized system like blockchain, which replaced the governance service that being provided by other governments and regulators. So if we take this system and we say everybody can come in and everybody can take his assets, and instead of enlisting them in the regular bursa, uh, just put a token to it, and you can transfer this asset digitally, it becomes more efficient, more liquid, more uh, 
available and accessible to everybody. And this is the new thing. And we already see um, big real estate companies taking uh, buildings and making them, you know, tokenizing them, issuing a token that would hold the right to deed for that, that assets. And by that, basically taking a simple real estate asset, making it digital, digital, and bypassing the enlisting very painful process that we used to have until now. And this is the new era. Thank Sh you. That was Shirley, can I add something? I, I just want to add specific that what is interesting with, with the security tokens is the bundle of characteristic that is with blockchain is available. For the first time, they can be traded 24-7. They can rapidly settle. Like ASICs for the first time are going to reduce settlement for T plus two to T plus one. I mean, you, you, you set you, T, T plus one, no, to T plus one. For the first time, to T plus one, not to T plus zero. I mean, you can reduce all the transaction costs. You can have, a, 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 oh, I'm sorry, I cannot speak. You can have transactional ownership. You can have rapid settlement. I mean, for the first, for the first time, you can have all the bundle of characteristics that you don't have on the tr traditional assets, mm -hmm. okay? This is what happened f for the first time. I mean, you, you don't have it on the traditional stock exchange. I mean, you, you don't digitalize assets. You just disrupt markets. So. Yeah. And yeah. It's, also important to, it's also important to mention, I think, I don't know how many Israelis there are here, but uh, it's, it's very important for accessibility to uh, access to investments. Because if you're in Israel, for example, and you're a millennial, you probably won't be able to buy an apartment. Uh, and it's and real estate is a great investment, but you don't have access to it if you don't have the 25% down payment. But here, you can enjoy those great returns that uh, a real estate um, a, that a real estate can real estate can offer by buying maybe $10,000 worth a, a share of an asset. Um, so it provides access for uh, investments to people who have never had access or wouldn't have had. What's the difference? This is secure. What do you mean? This mean you can buy it's not different. It's just easier. Who, it's no who, different. Who can buy? Millennials in Israel can buy a house. You don't Great. can buy it. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's true. It's, it's, uh, it's similar to a RIT, uh, the same way as a digital currency is similar to an ETF that is holding multiple currencies. Uh, uh, it is just that it is cumbersome not always accessible. You cannot buy a REIT of an apartment in Rothschild Avenue in Tel Aviv. You can do it if you have an apartment in Rothschild Avenue, you can, you can tokenize it. You don't have to be BlackRock to do that. Uh, the access to tokenizing and the access to tokenized assets uh, becomes without those uh, um, artificial barriers. Uh, but, but it's true, we're not inventing, it's not alchemy, we're not uh, inventing new instruments, we're uh, adding new features to existing in instruments, one that are uh, democratizing a lot of the, of, of the financial world. It probably will be more liquid. Yeah, liquidity is, an issue, is also a major issue. So access is one, one thing, but also when you buy a REIT, if you want to sell your share, it's, you need to find a buyer, Somebody needs to facilitate it. The no, they are, they list it on the stock exchange. <laughs> right. I think, I think the major point is when you tokenize an individual asset, you can actually tokenize a specific apartment or a specific uh, diamond or a specific... And, and how would that be more liquid than the REIT that owns a whole... Sh several shopping centers, several buildings. I mean, I, what it won't, I, I, it won't I, necessarily be more liquid, but what is interesting, and this is one of the things that blew my mind when I started um, investing in blockchain, is that uh, there are mechanisms that are decentralized that can facilitate the exchange between you and I. For the first, the first type of blockchain assets that I exchange were on decentralized exchanges. This means that these are exchanges that are not, necessi not necessarily regulated, or not regulated at all, not controlled by anyone. And effectively, what was happening was that I was transacting with someone else on the other side, peer-to-peer, -peer, without anybody in the middle. And this, 
this kind of revelation or this capability of being able to transact in a decentralized way, peer to peer, is is what made uh, is what is what created the efficiency. And I agree with you that being able to tokenize a specific apartment doesn't mean that it's going to be more liquid because. Um, in reality, it's probably much more likely that you'll be able to uh, liquidate. Um. But it's probably easier to trust it. I mean, if you look at, um, there's a company in Israel called uh, Critium, that what they're doing is they're, they're creating a marketplace for secondary, uh, the secondary life cycle of loans, okay? If you look at the 2008 financial crisis, there's a reason we don't trust the banks to bundle up loans. You, I mean, when you when you buy when you buy um, uh, a security for like a security backed uh, backed loans, you don't know what's in these bundles. You st you didn't know in two thousand before two thousand and eight, and you still don't know today. But if it's if it's on the blockchain and it's completely revealed to everyone, the, you can assess the specific risk. You can choose the specific as the specific asset or whatever loan that that you're buying. Everything is clear, and you you're not trusting some you know, uh, rating agency in New York that you don't know what their incentives are. Can, can, can I just play the, the party pooper for a second? <coughs> again. Um, again. Again. <laughs> it seems to be your, it seems to my role. Um, at, at the end of the day, <coughs> this is all, all of this is very nice, and, and lots of people can make lots of money from cryptocurrencies, but a lot of people can lose a lot of money from cryptocurrencies as well. Um, I mean, the statistics, again, I don't know where people get their statistics from, uh, and maybe some of them are true and some of them aren't, but I think it's perfectly believable that half a billion dollars worth of investment in cryptocurrencies this year has been lost by the investors. Um, because another statistic says 80% of all ICOs are fraud, 10% of the rem of 10 are, are, uh, have no substance to them, and of the remaining 10%, most of those will fail. Um, so, so right now we are at the very, very beginning of this revolution, and it is a revolution, and, and decentralization, and, and a dis distributed ledger is, all, is, 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 is absolutely where, where the market is moving, and we're going to see it moving there. We're going to see the trends increasing over time. We were already seeing 2017 was, was, was the sort of the, the beginning of the madness for ICOs. 2018, people said things are all, everything's going to slow down. The SEC's interested in this now. All the various regulators are interested in all of this now. Everything's going to slow down. And what's happened? We're now seeing what, where $6 billion was raised in ICOs last year. $12 billion has been raised in ICOs in the first six months of this year. So it hasn't slowed down. It, it, it's continuing apace. Um, but at the end of the day, it is still in its infancy, and, and, and while we, we talk about the, the transparency of the ledger, you know, I, I'd like to know how many people can actually read a ledger and understand what on earth it is that the ledger says. I certainly can't, and I suspect, you know, 0.0000001% of anybody who owns a cryptocurrency understands what on earth is going on on that ledger that is transparent to the public. So it's all there, it's happening. I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk this, this phenomenon down because you know, I, I make my living on, on this phenomenon. Um, <laughs> I was gonna ask well, you if this is what you tell your clients. <laughs> but, 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 you know, but, but at the end of the day, we are seeing fantastic companies coming in and, and wanting to uh, um, use the blockchain to create fantastic technology. Some clients will come in and they have nothing to do with, 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 with blockchain technology whatsoever. They've heard that you can make loads of money on ICO. Everybody, it's, it's the buzz. We want to make money on an ICO. Uh, and and how, how do we do that? And I'll tell them, you're not. It's not going to happen. And on the other side of the scale, you'll have people that come in with very, very specific crypto technology-based um, ideas and that's fantastic. And there's a whole bunch of companies in between that, that kind of want to use this social economy, that this cooperative economy where everybody, every stage of value, value creation makes money. Um, and, 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 and they're creating some sort of platform that, that, that will, will make use of that. But at the end of the day, all of this has to be, in my opinion, regulated in some way. Nobody wants to miss the boat. No country right now wants to miss the boat. Everybody says, you know, we want to have, take Israel for an example, we want to encourage blue and white industry, want to create blue and white leadership of the crypto world. But on the other hand, we don't want to create for ourselves a haven where people invest in Israeli companies and they all get burned because, because fraud just, everything's either fraudulent or, or a waste of time. So you have to kind of create a balance of regulation. So yes, it's decentralized, but on the other hand, the central authorities all come in and say, it can be decentralized, but up to a point. We have to actually make sure that, every, that, that these ICOs 
are regulated in some way. So in other words, it doesn't necessarily have to look like an IPO. It doesn't have to have all of the disclosure that you have at an IPO, but it does have to have some level of disclosure. There has to be some level of, 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 of um, regulation that ensures there's no money laundering involved in this, that the people who are giving you money aren't using it to launder you know, money gained from terrorist activities. Um, so all of this needs to come into force as well. So, so, so I just want to kind of roll back the, the excitement for, 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 the, for, the, for the crypto revolution. Yes, it's important, but there are an awful lot of hurdles to overcome yet, and, and an awful lot of people are falling victim to the buzz right now. And I think we all have to be a little, you know, have to be cautious in our, in our, in our expectations. Sorry. Can I ask do, a question? Do you want it to be? Sure, let's uh, go ahead. You already asked the mic and everything. Um, <clears throat> I fully agree with the analogies you just made. Yeah. Can you give us the name? Sure, Gil Milikovsky. I have been at full disclosure. I'm invested in uh, the high angels because I understand nothing in cryptocurrency, I understand nothing in blockchains. <laughs> From the little I understand, though, it's clearly a fad some of which will be just a bubble that will evade, and when the dust will settle, the real blockchain will then appear. But that can take another five years, another 10 years, and who knows how long. I think one has to distinguish blockchains that have a very efficient use. That is applied, as there must be a reason why IBM and Musk are using blockchain in order to track containers. I happen to be invested in a company that has worked with IBM. That's how I discovered IBM is in blockchain. And that's not a fly-by-night company. And they're not doing it for Chris. IB what, sorry? <laughs> One day you'll hear about it. One day. But what I do see is a lot of taking advantage of people's emotions to rush to the gold that doesn't exist. And I'm very concerned personally that will hit the real estate market. Because when I hear what some of you say, that there is a lack of liquidity, and I heard it in another meeting, the Alchemist meeting, where actually there were several real estate and RITs actually, mm -hmm. and they were complaining there's not enough liquidity in the real estate market. Now, I never heard such bullshit in my life, excuse me. Because the big danger here, if you want to buy a house, if it's in the States or in Israel, you just have to put down payment, it's different. But then, either that asset goes up or goes down, pending demand and offer. Now, if you put now artificially, what I would call virtual money, monopoly money, that would call cryptocurrency and whatever I see you want, you now create a layer of wind that has absolutely no consistency backup. The bank has used already 80% or 60% or whatever significant amount of percentage of your assets, the apartment, the building, whatever it is. Now you want to get it liquid on top of what it is, assuming the value of it, and let's say that it went from 1 million to 6 million, but you don't want to sell it, so you just go ahead and create a, a phony ICO for the difference. This is the recipe for trouble, and it could very definitely cause another financial crisis. Well, once it's big, very let, big when you go uh, into real estate. Do you want to take it? Well, go ahead. So I, 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 I think you've just cooked a recipe and, and then uh, gave your opinion of, of a recipe that you've cooked. Um, I, I, so I, I don't think that when we discuss, so I, I don't think that when we discuss security tokens, we are discussing uh, virtual currencies being invented yeah, exactly. out of real estate. What we're discussing is the ability to, uh, um, to um, liquidate in the sense that you can take one ownership of a, uh, of, of, of a real estate and, and part it to as many tokens as you want. And you can now offer the ability to buy 10 meters in an apartment or to buy just the right for the rent for five years of this apartment. You can have uh, multiple instruments which are fully regulated um, um, based on the same asset. 
it doesn't mean to liquidate the asset doesn't mean that you get that anyone gets to invent a number of currencies or of tokens that are not reflecting the actual ownership of the asset. Okay. I think that the, the difference, and, and to the question uh, uh, you posed uh, uh, previously, I think that the difference is, is the way to approach the long tail. So obviously, um, you can buy uh, um, a, a, a portion of a REIT fund. And obviously, you have no problem with liquidity if you own a Facebook stock. But if you own an, an uh, iron source stock, um, still private, right, iron source? Mm -hmm. um, and it's worth uh, almost a billion dollars, and you might be an employee at iron source, you do not have liquidity for this stock. If you own a mobilized stock, which we know now is worth $15 billion, a year ago, you ca it is not liquid. You're not a part of the game because of this uh, artificial barrier of whether it's public or not public, of whether this asset is a part of a REIT or not part of a, of a REIT. And what we can do with blockchain is uh, to demolish this artificial ba uh, barrier and to provide liquidity to the long tail of assets and to the long tail of, of ownership. Now, I'm, I'm not dismissing your concerns. Uh, I, I'm not sure I agree with uh, the 80% fraud statistics, but definitely there is fraud. I think that what we're seeing is a maturing of this industry, both in the way, uh, in, in the players that are engaging. If at first it was the anarchists and the ones that are attempting the AML um, and the fraud, now we're seeing respectable <coughs> actors from one end, and from the, in the uh, other end, we're seeing the regulator that used uh, for a very long time an approach of too small to care, uh, understanding that there is no uninvent button, that at least for some use cases it makes sense and therefore it, it is increasingly growing and that it is time to face it with policy. Um, so we, we've underwent three regulatory phases. The first one was it is too small, it will vanish. The second one was we will be able to shut it down when we want to. And the third one is realizing, it's, it's a, a bit like grief processes. Uh, the third one is realizing it is not small anymore. Uh, we cannot shut it down. And now it's time we face it with policy. And, and we, we separate the black chain and the white chain. And I think that uh, uh, most regulators are doing a quite decent job in making sure that we benefit from the long tail liquidity, uh, which is far from being bullshit. Uh, but uh, 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 making sure at the same time that we're alienating the, the players that are trying to scam uh, or, to, um, or to ride the, the, the fund. With all due respect, you, you did not answer the question. Because when you say you're going to monetize, digitalize, iconize, call it whatever you want, uh, one meter, five meters, or whatever of an apartment, how does that connect with a loan you have that you borrowed money to buy that apartment? How does that connect to your ability to survive? That's not how it works. It's, it's not. It's of course, well, that's the have, problem. If, well, so we say, when you talk about the real value of the apartment, the apartment no, no, for, I mean, when you talk about it, real estate, it, when, when it says say it has two ways. One second, let me just finish the sentence, and I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen. But I, I, please address the concern. And I'm not the only one that raises that concern. The word real estate has two words, real and estate. Now you come with something that is, for the moment, fictitious. Now, how do you connect it and make it real? How do you make the value of it not speculative? And now this apartment is was worth hundred thousand dollars, suddenly worth a billion dollar. That's exactly where the regulation this comes in. Exactly. Imagine. Uh, let, let's first separate between um, ICOs and the notion of securitizing assets. Imagine that today a real estate developer, instead of going to Blackstone uh, for, for funding, uh, for funding the, the development, he can go to the world and offer anybody to help fund the real estate development that he's doing. And instead of giving either Blackstone or several family offices a few apartments, each person that's involved in this specific development will contribute a smaller amount and receive a smaller portion of the project. It doesn't mean that it's a virtual currency or an ICO, it's just a new uh, funding mechanism and a way to tokenize or digitize the asset itself. But you do need regulation. So you just okay. described, by the way, the concept you of unit trust. Mm -hmm. You just described the concept of unit trust that exists in the real estate world. 
That's exactly how we operate. With, with like five less intermediaries taking... Uh, taking no, there's no intermediary. We can do it directly. I mean, I'm from Australia, as you know. By the way, my name is Albert Adon. I have to say my name. Mm -hmm. uh, Shelley, first of all, I want to thank you because you've put together a panel of fantastic people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really want to commend you for that. And I can see that uh, you have to have some brains to do what you guys are doing. And in the process, uh, you're losing most of us because the vocabulary that you're using, I don't have. So I'm glad we're recording all of this because I'm going to have to listen to the whole thing several times. And eventually, I hope to understand what you've been talking about. Um, <laughs> but having, having said that, there are certain basic principles, you know, there. First principles uh, to do anything. And, um, okay, let's say that you've got... Um, this fantastic way to, to decentralize. What, what, what one thing that confuses me a bit is that the, the Bitcoin thing started because it wanted to be um, uh, totally decentralized and away from all regulators. And now what I'm hearing is that we're back to complete regulations and total centralization. So that's interesting. That, um, let me just say But, but that. If, if I haven't, uh, let, let, okay. let me, let me uh, I, I put it all there and then you can, you can, you can answer. <clears throat> so that's on the, on the first uh, side. On the second, um, I'm hearing a little bit of hype. I hear it loud and clear. And I think that you have to be careful because then you're becoming exactly like the security industry, especially when it was in its infancy. And let me tell you, there's been, in the history of the security, there's been back at shops. You know what that is? If you don't, Google it and you'll find out. And it, it was terrible. Uh, the, and so the regulations, the regulators really had to play a real, uh, an incredible role for us today to be able to buy and sell shares and be comfortable that we're actually doing something that is real. But we didn't get to this point in time without having gone through eras that uh, were absolutely horrible for investors. Uh, so uh, what I'm afraid is that uh, the unknown that uh, comes through a very opaque vocabulary for me stops me because I don't know where you guys are at. I mean, you, you can tell me anything you want, uh, and, but I'm not going to give you my money that easily, right? So I need to know effectively that there are some regulations and so on. Now, what I'm hearing also is that, for instance, Shelley, you said Bitcoin is at $7,000. I think it's about six. Last time I checked, but that's, uh, that's about a week ago. So 6.7. This thing moves like a rocket. I mean, a few months ago, it was at $14,000. So, 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 or 20. So if you are ass assuming that you, there would have been a few people buying it at 20 or at 16, let's say, they, will, they would have lost half their money. Uh, they wouldn't be that happy, right? So in other words, once it fluctuates, we're back into the normal world and it becomes a regular investment, and then uh, you have to look at it uh, on the volatility curve basis, and the more volatile it is, and the less money you put in, right? Uh, and also, anything that starts is very volatile. Now, the, the other thing, you talked about apartments being liquid. So let me tell you, if everybody takes his apartment and put it, securitize it the way you want it to be, you can call it whatever you, do, you, 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 you want, it's, a security, what you, you're talking about. You're yeah, transforming it yeah. into a security. Yeah, yeah. It is. And therefore, let's say that you've got, everybody has an apartment in there. I mean, how is that changing the fact that you're putting your apartment in the market? You're going to sell your entire apartment a lot easier than selling it piece by piece when it, there's a complete confusion. Because if I want to sell an apartment and I'm a real estate developer, at least I've got nice uh, catalogs, cataloging all of my apartments, telling you exactly what you're getting, and it's fully transparent. You're getting the whole, the whole understanding of it. Um, how am I going to know that you're secretizing an apartment in a certain address? Um, what am I buying? I mean, so so what I'm saying, this we're getting into the hype. That is, I understand that you want to be very clever and you want to be uh, futuristic and have this great vision. But I would strongly suggest that you don't oversell what you've got. And uh, it, because the more you're trying to oversell and the more you're going to scare people away. So um, now you can answer. I got it. Ah, uh, let me just oh, I, I refer. Owe, I owe answers. Yes. I 
O answer <laughs> just from yeah. before. I well, I, I just I just want to say something important because everybody is speaking about bubbles, crisis, capital markets. Well, everybody is referring to crypto and blockchains as a bubble. It's going to be the most interesting bubble we ever had because it's non-funded by banking organizations. So I'm waiting to see what kind of a bubble is going to be. It's all funded by people themselves. When we, when we look back about bubbles we had, the dot com, back long gone to the 29 crisis, all bubbles, all financial crisis was well funded by banking organization. Well, crypto is not funded by banking organization. And the list of it that is funded by credit cards, not anymore, are with least default. So please remember, I, I, well, I can send all of you the numbers. Okay, the, but... The tulip bubble in 1400s in Holland was not funded by financial. <laughs> right, but... Well, well you caught me, and... and Another thing about hype, I, I think that we are actually approaching the hope because, and I would love, sh I would love Shelley to correct me from the VC perspective. I actually thinking that the market is getting into normalized during the last six months. We, we are actually seeing the speculative hype dying. We see VCs getting into the market. We see this big company like Microsoft getting it into huge project like copyright identity project. We see Nasdaq built in crypto exchange. Six, uh, uh, the, the biggest Swiss exchange just announcing built in a crypto exchange, ec um, including post trading solution. The Frankfurt biggest derivative exchange building crypto solution. So I, I think that we are getting a normalized market. I think that the scams definition is not correct. I think that what we are not hearing about is the beautiful market participant that building a, building a self-organization, code of conduct. We have the Brooklyn project. We have global digital finance. Even here in Israel, Ido is actually the founder of the Israeli Blockchain Association, having a code of conduct. I think that the, is, the industry is building beautiful thing, and the market is getting into normalization. I think the hype is down, and I would love Shelley to correct me from a VC perspective. So, I, I, can I, I respond? I just want to, oh, you know, you, sure. you made three points in your long speech. The first one was regulations. The second one was hype. And the third one was flooding the market with secu securitizing assets versus like selling apartments on a brochure. So just to make it short, when blockchain and crypto and Bitcoin came about, there were two revelations there. One was anonymity, and the second one was decentralization. Anonymity meant that on the Bitcoin, when you made a deal, nobody knew who you are and where you are. There was the best way to trade drugs and to take ransom because you can ask to get paid in Bitcoin and nobody knew where you are, what you are, where you're holding. And this is what Adrian was talking about, the laundering money, the money for terror and everything else. The Silk Road. And the Silk Road was one, of the, was one of the main applications that used Bitcoin. So this aspect is being heavily regulated now. Until now, they didn't pay attention to it, but now it's being heavily regulated. And we see the anonymity the fact that people can trade and be there without being their identity revealed, that's going out. The KYC, the AML, all these regulations are coming into business. However, the second part of the blockchain, the decentralization, the fact that you can have a, uh, a mechanism, a system that works without needing the central bank or the central insurance agency or whoever it is, or government, to be a mediator in transactions, that's what happens today. When you want to move money today from point A to point B, the bank calls you and asks you a question. You really want to move it. Where's your tax certificate? Where's the money from? 
that is going to go away because it's going to be decentralized. I can do it with you. Decentralization means more efficient, less bias, having an impartial uh, governance, all the things that we discussed. So yes, there is a huge regulation that's coming in about, and it's great, the regulations, because it's taking away all the people we don't want in the industry, but the efficiency of the decentralized system is still there. It's not being impact. That's one thing. The hype, you're right, and you're right. There was a major hype today, and that's why people are taking advantage of people, what we call the suckers, who don't understand, and they're taking the money. And that's exactly what happened 18 years ago with the dot-com bubble. You had a company, shoelace.com, they would sell shoelace on the internet, and their stock, their stock price would go booming. And then, eventually, it took time for the market to understand that, yes, internet is great, but if you don't have a value to offer, then your, your price is going to go down. And those companies were taken away, and we have the internet now, we have Facebook, we have everything. So this but, is what's going to happen. But we also blockchain. have Yahoo's, who began before the dot-com. Right. Uh, I'm saying Yahoo and, began yeah. before the dot-com, yeah. and, and other companies, be, be, not many, but other companies, Amazon did. 12% 12, 12 of the companies right. before the dot-com but, but became unique. But I'm just saying there was a lot of garbage there that cleaned out. And we look at the blockchain today, there are a lot of opportunists who came in, took the money from people and ran. But the cycle today is much shorter. It takes much less time now to clean those. And even though we see much more, a lot more of ICOs today, the amount of fraud or the amount of pointless ICOs just for the hype today is much less than in 2017, just a year. So I'm saying there's still room for betterment and there's still room to improvement, but the market is going the right way. I'd like to, to comment to the, to the question of it started decentralized and, and now you're looking for, we're looking at regulation again. Well, uh, first of all, I personally don't feel obliged to the vision of a Satoshi Nakamoto who invented the Bitcoin. Uh, for me, he invented a set of, of uh, faculties which I can either use or not. And I don't think that decentralization in a me is a means, uh, is, is an end on its own. Um, but one must admit that um, the invention of Bitcoin moved the regulator even more than it moved the industry itself, right? Ten years ago, I wouldn't have been able to sit with the governor of the central bank. Uh, possibly I would have, but behind bars, uh, for inventing a new currency, um, right? Currency was uh, uh, really the, the premise of states to invent. The, possibili the possibility to speak uh, with governors to speak with the regulators about regulating a currency that is not issued by the state, um, it was only enabled by the fact that this decentralization meant that when the regulator wanted to uh, pursue the Bitcoin inventors, it, it had no one to pursue because anyone holding Bitcoin is one of the Bitcoin uh, 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 generators. Um, so I think there is an evolution, not only of the industry, but of the regulator itself. Uh, the, I, I think that uh, that there is one thing that is uh, strikingly important about this as a concept is that it reminded us of many of the things that the state was the only one able to do and that are now being attempted by uh, private sector and private sector not only corporates but foundations and, 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 and new governance structures uh, <laughs> such as money, uh, such as commoditizing and securitizing uh, assets, uh, which is not altogether a bad thing. The second uh, thing, uh, uh, and, and I'm taking responsibility for your uh, very gracious com uh, uh, compliment, um, if, if we weren't able to express what we're thinking, then, then it's, it's our fault. We have a problem. Uh, we, we need to be able, you know, Einstein once said that if uh, the, the most important, uh, um, the most uh, um, complicated theory, if someone cannot explain to you in five minutes, either he doesn't want you to understand or he doesn't understand it on its own. So uh, I, I feel that we, we are here because we want you to understand, and I, I, I think that we understand it, but something is obviously not working uh, well enough. I want to suggest my, my criteria for judging whether a blockchain project is, uh, is valid or not. Um, and, and the criteria is, is I use is who takes the decision? Who takes the decisions in governing, and who takes the decisions in, in changing the contract? Because if the decisions are eventually taken uh, uh, in a central way, then blockchain is just a buzz. 
there is no reason for blockchain. When a central bank discusses issuing a blockchain currency, it makes no sense because the central bank is about centrally taking decisions. Uh, and it's not about being digital because we can digitalize without the blockchain. Actually, most of the money in the world is already digital unless you're living in Japan where 20% of, of money is cash. cash. So it's, it's really about who takes... Sorry? Um, so, so, so it's, it's really about who takes the decision. And if the decisions are being taken by the consensus, then there is at least premise for uh, looking into such a blockchain program. Exactly, exactly. Thank you, Ido. And I actually, I actually wanted to also kind of add on to that and let, let me know if this is helpful. Um, if you think about the society and the way we've been throughout history transacting with one another, Several years ba back, it's always been through, through banks and through government institutions. Whenever I wanted to transfer money to Albert de Don, I needed to put it, you know, I, I, I would usually go through some sort of intermediary. I would transfer it through the bank. The bank would vet it, would show that I have the, the amount of funds and would send it to Albert de Don. And Throughout the years, one of the issues that we've always had with this, these archaic institutions is that it, they're kind of like a black box. We don't know how much fees we're paying. We don't know what they're doing, uh, what they're doing with our money. We don't know what they're doing with, with our data. We're worried that potentially one day they can fail. And indeed, in 2008, we saw that there were banks out there that failed. And as technology has evolved over the last several decades with the internet, we have created digital marketplaces, marketplaces like Uber, and marketplaces like Tinder, and marketplaces like Airbnb. And these marketplaces have reduced the level of trust that we required within one another. We were able to transact with more freely. For example, I, I feel today comfortable going into the car of a stranger if I know he's through Uber. And same thing with Tinder. I can date someone that I look on the phone and I, you know, I'll go on a date the next day. These are things that today we take for granted. But several years ago, we would never do it. We would never do it. And the next evolution of this, if, if you're kind of seeing what's happening to society and the generations throughout time, is that we're creating and the generations below us are looking for products that provide them with more value and with more transparency and with more, with more fairness. Because even these digital marketplaces, even though they improved our experience, they're much more quick, they're much more transparent, they're much more on demand than they were in the past. They still have issues. They're, they're also, they can also fail. They also use our data to justify their existence. They're sometimes very expensive. Sometimes if I use Airbnb, I need to pay 20% to, to rent my apartment or to rent someone else's apartment. And the whole idea of blockchain is that with blockchain, we're creating governance systems that don't need to be centralized. You theoretically don't need anymore to have a company in the middle that needs to extract value from the network in order for the network to exist. It's most similar to a project, for example, like Wikipedia. If you think of Wikipedia and how much value that added to the world, just the fact by having so many people contribute their knowledge and a central uh, and, and a knowledge base that's... Wikipedia? Okay. Well, my, well, again, it, it's all a matter of liquidity. If you go to the Apple page or if you go to the Warren Buffett page on Wikipedia, you can be pretty certain that that will be relatively, relatively on, on point. But as you go to things that are more esoteric, then you know, then you have, then, then you're having information that's crowdsourced, which is natural. But I think that nobody in this room can argue the value that a project like Wikipedia gave to us. Now, blockchain and this specific dialogue was here not to um, sell blockchain in any way, but rather to highlight the different things that blockchain can do. Specifically, the di digitization of assets, it really has nothing to do with ICOs. It's just another feature of how blockchain can create efficiency within the ecosystem and replace certain banking and financial institutions. But it really, uh, but it really, it's just the process of disintermediation. And, but it's just a discussion around the possibilities of the technology itself rather than 
you know, selling, selling the technology. This is just part of what blockchain can help us do in the future. And we're not saying that everything right now needs to be put on the blockchain, but we're saying that there are applications and there are businesses in the world that, and these are specifically businesses where trust is required. And in places where trust is required, a lot of times you can replace a central government or a central governance mechanism with a set of rules or a set of code or a set of protocols. And that is, that is the way we see the benefits of blockchain. And to Ido's point, this is also how we, this is also how we assess the validity of, of blockchain projects. And uh, today we're at a point where we're investing specifically in uh, blockchain technologies, if you're interested, and looking for, for other, for, for, for ways to, to create these mechanisms and to support infrastructure for, for blockchain uh, projects. I've got a mic if someone else doesn't. I'm Marsha Thompson. I happen to be a Member of Parliament, so for me taxation is an issue. And the issue is that for those who uh, rely on government to support them, for children who rely on government to provide schools and education and healthcare and hospitals, how does the taxation system work and how do you ensure that taxes are collected and that they are contributing back to a broader social benefit? Well, the beautiful thing about blockchain is that it's a that it's traceable. Uh, it actually made the lives of everybody in federal governments and the CIA m much easier because now they're able to connect your, your address with your IP and know exactly what transactions have occurred on the blockchain. So... Um, I mean, uh, just, just from an Israeli legal point of view, the, the Israeli tax authority... Um, in I think March of this year, put out guidelines as how as to how um, cryptocurrencies should be should be taxed. For instance, so you know in in exactly the same they are there, there is a taxation mechanism in place for cryptocurrencies in the same way that there is a, a taxation mechanism in place for, for anything else. I mean it is going. I mean as we're seeing all the time in in this in this environment in this sort of universe of cryptocurrencies, everybody's playing catch up because. We have everybody, the, the regulators have to learn how this works, uh, and, and there are many sort of foxholes that, 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 that they get caught down and they have to kind of find their way out of again, but, but they are playing catch up, and, and, and as, as an example, the, 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 the tax authorities now have put out guidelines as to how to tax certain kinds of cryptocurrencies. They haven't yet put out down guidelines for how to tax other forms of cryptocurrencies, utilities versus security uh, uh, tokens. But it's happening, and it will happen. I mean, I don't think there's going to be, and, and, and as Shelley said, that there is actually, an, in the most case, I mean, obviously there are certain currencies where anonymity is, 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 is you know, Monero and, 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 and mm -hmm. Zcash, you know, make, make, makes, things, makes it difficult to trace the, 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 the holders of these currencies. But generally speaking, um, it will not be a problem, I think, for the authorities to know how to tax profits made from crypto, you know, income or profits made from cryptocurrencies. What bothers me are several, uh, I mean, the dark side of, um, of, uh, of the, the crypto world. Uh, I think we have to make a distinction, and uh, you pointed out, uh, we have to distinguish between um, using it as a technology to uh, 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 have transactions with things of value, and uh, cryptocurrency that doesn't have any value except uh, as a delusion or illusion or whatever that people holding it uh, have for it. It's like the uh, tulips of the uh, 17th uh, century. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't have any real value if the society decides, oh, if the people decide that it has, it's worth more, it's going to be worth more. If it's worth less, then it's going to be worth less. I don't want to have my, uh, what? It takes uh, electric, some, I mean, I can uh, use the electricity to generate uh, Bitcoins, but it's only the value that uh, we give, uh, you know, that the transactors of the of the currency 
give it that, that it has. I, I know that isn't I that, Isn't that how, how the value of any share works? No, because uh, <coughs> if, I, yeah, if uh, I have a dollar, if I give a dollar, yeah. if I, I know, invest my, uh, my pension in, uh, in US dollars, I know that the US government is going to back up. What? So, you mean, so that's so trust. <laughs> What, what you mean is you believe no, the US no trust, government. But, but for Bitcoin, th there is no trust. There's no one I can trust. Like uh, the, the whole society can decide that uh, I know what. I mean, we all know that if uh, something happens in the stock market, everyone uh, runs for gold, which is the same thing. There's no such. I mean, there's no real value for gold because uh, it's all a matter oh, of trust. So I, 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 I think we're mixing a, 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 a bit. Okay, so that's one a, thing. A, that's a few. That's, um, okay, so no. So what I'm asking is. Uh, is there anything of real value behind yeah. the Bitcoin? That's one question. The second question is, what, would you, what will you do, say, yeah, 10 years down the road when uh, quantum computers will uh, show up and suddenly uh, all those things which are, uh, um, uh, are going to be hackable? Um, is it something that worries you? Uh, or not. I mean, I know that uh, all uh, major uh, governments are investing millions of uh, dollars so that uh, the, oh, also some large companies <coughs> uh, are investing a lot of money in quantum computers and I know what, 10 years down the road uh, it's going to be hackable and uh, it could be that some of those things are going to be totally worthless and then even though people have had trust in it and that's what gave it the value, suddenly it's going to uh, disappear. Yeah. So I, I'd like to take this one, and uh, I'll start with the second one because it's, it's uh, the easiest. Since the dawn of time, uh, it has always been about uh, um, the, uh, the shield and the sword. And you invent a better sword, and then someone else invents a better shield, and then in turn you invent a better sword, and someone else invents a better shield. Um, and um, the same goes for quantum computing. Uh, so yes, is, is, is it worrisome? It is, but as soon as uh, quantum computing would be used to break hash and, and cryptography, it will be thereafter used to create new hashes and new cryptography. And therefore, it is only to some extent worrisome, um, just as much as, as a, new, um, a new weapon system that, um, um, that can penetrate a defense uh, shield is worrisome until one builds a better defense shield. Um, but I think there is no intrinsic protection from the fact that we are uh, uh, constantly evolving and once the attack is, is constantly evolving, the defense is evolving as well. Um, as to the intrinsic value of money, this is very elusive, but it, one does not need to wait for blockchain um, to contemplate the meaning of money. Um, I would like to suggest that money uh, is just a quantifier of trustworthiness. If you would have told 200 years ago, uh, or even 100 years ago, or you know what, even in the 70s, uh, or in, in the end of, by the end of the 60s, that governments can account for their own, uh, for, for the value of their own currencies without having to hold uh, $35 per ounce of gold in Fort Knox or in the Royal Mint, then in the 60s, it would have probably uh, uh, um, uh, ended in, in quite a quarrel. In the 30s, um, it, 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 people would have laughed. And therefore, the Federal Reserve and the Royal Mint decided to uh, base the entirety of their value in the previously trusted contract, which is gold. Uh, because the, the premise that a state is trustworthy when it comes to redeeming its currency was, was ludicrous. Uh, but Let's go back to gold. But, but, but gold doesn't have an intrinsic value as well. Gold is not drawing its value from the ability to create jewelry. It only drives uh, its value from the trust, from a common trust or a consent that gold has its value. And therefore, just like we've learned to trust many other, as, as Shelley very well uh, uh, articulated, we're trusting technology more than, than in the past. Um, if I wanted to go from here to, uh, to the old city uh, 10 years ago, I would have had to ask someone and trust him that he will lead me my way. And now I'm trusting my ways or Google Maps to do that. Um, why does it seem so implausible that we can trust algorithms um, to uh, re replace the Stanley Fishers and Janet Yellens in accounting for currency um, 
and ones that are not impacted uh, from political biases, for example, um, we can at least entertain the thought that we, create, we can create an alternative governance. Time will tell if it's better or, or, or not, and whether it's always better or always worse. But it is at least worth entertaining the thought that we can create algorithmic governance that has been proven in so many cases to be superior to human-based uh, 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 governance, and this is what will give the intrinsic trust um, to currencies that are governed by algorithms. Now, when it comes to Bitcoin, I agree, and this is exactly what my company does, uh, the, the inherent volatility is way too big, and it's too big because the trying to shift in trust abruptly is, is creating risk. Um, we can have reservations in regards to fiat, but we learn to trust fiat currencies for the past 100 years. And if we are to learn to trust anything new, then it needs to be gradually, just like trusting fiat started off with backing it in gold, uh, to allow for a gradual accumulation of trust before in 1971 departing from the golden standard. Uh, but I think that uh, insinuating that Bitcoin, uh, so, uh, so I don't believe that Bitcoin is properly constructed to become a currency, but I at the same time disagree with the saying that it has no intrinsic value. It has just as much intrinsic value as gold or as fiat currencies, um, and the, the, how much of this intrinsic value the market will determine, just, just as much as the market determines the value uh, of the US dollar or, or of gold. It is about the, the ability to create a, a governance scheme that is trustworthy. And it's also important to remember that you all come from governments that you trust. We're all here from Israel, UK, Australia, and the United States. Why did you say we trust? Relative, <laughs> relatively trust. Um, when you think about, when you, what, part of the projects, for example, we also have a foundation. Part of the projects that we're thinking about is, for example, okay, what about blockchainization of the aid to UNRWA or to, uh, or to Gaza in general? Because we have a problem that the people I don't know if the people trust the government or not, probably not, but we don't trust the government there. So, but, and all of a sudden, there's a technological advancement that allows us to interact directly with the citizens of Gaza, providing them certain aid, whether it's uh, just wiring them money directly without having to go through the intermediary of whoever's in power, or uh, as was done in the World Food Program pilot um, it, with uh, distribution of uh, aid to uh, refugees from Syria that rather than rather than trusting NGOs on the ground that God knows uh, uh, the waste that happens on the way slash if the people the end the end user I mean the the people who are supposed to get the aid actually get it um, the UN uh, food program actually had a pilot where they used blockchain to uh, scan the eyes of refugees people who who uh, our, was in the systems as refugees and they got their food directly, uh, uh, they got their aid directly from specific supermarkets and this was all blockchain based. So what if we could do the same in Gaza or pl other places where we give them aid anyways, where we wanna give more aid, but we wanna make sure that it goes straight to the citizens. So keep in mind that when we're talking about cutting intermediaries um, and trust, some intermediaries need to be cut and some aren't trustworthy as much as our governments, and this provides a solution that allows us to have a lot of uh, policy advancement that we couldn't have before. Thank you very much, everyone. Unfortunately, we Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.